Hello everybody and welcome to the PC Gamer Show. My name is Tom Marks, Associate Editor here at PC Gamer and your host, as always. Joining me this week, we have, back from last week, Mr. Wes Fenlin. Hey, sorry, I'm chewing on a peppermint right now, so I'm just gonna... You you were really not prepared for the start this of this This is good podcast. radio, right? Yeah. Oh, you don't, you don't want to smell my, like, turkey lunch breath, so gotcha. this is for you, Tom. Well, thank you. I, I'm glad you are prioritizing me over all of our v- listeners. That's Always. That's nice. Uh, Also joining us today, not chewing a peppermint, through the internet, Mr. Tyler Wild. We can't smell his breath because he is not in the room. Tyler, how you doing? It's a good thing. I was looking for something on my desk to start chewing, but (laughs) all I could find was a bottle cap. (laughs) (laughs) Tell tell me you haven't chewed on a bottle cap at some point in your life. I'm sure I have. I definitely have. Right off the bat, we have four subscribers. P- PJS37, nice. thank you very much. Mildos for two months. Living Chris, isn't that... Wait a minute. I think I know that guy. I think that might be Chris Livingston. Uh, Crazy Connect 84 for seven months. Thank you very much, guys. I, I appreciate you guys all very much, and we appreciate you here listening. We've got a very good show for you today. Uh, a little bit of a, a switched-up schedule, teeny bit. Um, we've moved the latest news section after the now playing because there's kind of just a bunch of different things going on that I want to talk about in a little bit more depth. Uh, but the big story this week that we're going to talk about is Star Wars. Star Wars Battlefront 2 got actually announced. We talk about, talked about the leaked trailer last week. Um, a longer trailer and lots of details have since been announced at Star Wars Celebration over the weekend. In Orlando. Orlando. Which uh, we actually had a, a writer at. Sam Sam Roberts from the UK was was there in Orlando, went to see whatever they were showing from Battlefront and talked to people and then probably buy some Star Wars crap. I don't know, I don't know what Sam did there <laughs> with the rest of his weekend, but he was there having fun. Nick Warrior 5 also just subscribed for four months. Yeah, no, it, it was... Um... It's a lot of stuff came out of it, both video game and otherwise. So we'll be able to break that stuff down. And of course, we're going to take your questions from the Twitch chat at the end of the show. So stick around. Let us know what you want to talk about then. Uh, We'll get to that. But let's start the show as we always do, talking about what we've been playing lately. I'll guess, though, not not as we always do lately. Usually we've been spending about 10 minutes talking about news. But we're going to do that longer. And we want to talk about what we've been playing lately first. Um, so, so anything you guys have been, been into big lately? I'm going to let Tyler go first. What because me? of the mint. Uh, putting, that... you, putting you on the spot. No, not at Damn all because of the mint that I'm trying not to chew loudly. <laughs> uh, I've been playing a ton of Battlefield 1, uh, after a sort of hiatus to do a ton of Mass Effect coverage. I'm done with Mass Effect. I beat the story and I put it aside. Although I haven't done like probably 80% of the side stuff. No, that, that's not accurate. I did a lot of side stuff. So you but, beca- uh, you've been uh, becoming like a, a smoke grenade expert in Battlefield, right? Yeah, I was noticing people were using smokes more and more as I was playing. And I sort of traced it back to a couple Reddit threads where people were talking about how great smoke was and no one's using it. And they were right, actually. Smoke is awesome. Um People don't really use it in Battlefield 1 because, I think primarily because you don't get any points for using it. Like, you're not going to get any kills from a smoke grenade, obviously, um, except for, you know, maybe as a result. But uh, I found them really fun. Like, there's a lot of frustrating moments in Battlefield 1 where you're completely pinned down by, you know, uh, support guys like 200 meters away lying prone on a sand dune who just constantly tear you apart and there's not really a better solution for that in battlefield one than smoke grenades except for having a team with a lot of great counter snipers who are protecting you but that's you know it's not the most reliable strategy in a public game yeah you don't know what you're gonna get like sometimes you end up on a team that goes all snipers not all but has way too many and they end up losing the game but they make it completely frustrating and unfun because you're constantly getting sniped while they accrue points but that sure sounds like battlefield yeah but you still manage to hold the points because they don't have enough people actually you know hunkering down in buildings uh smoke grenades are a really nice way to 
make them feel sad. I should say that I play sniper. I play scout sometimes myself. I like hitting people from very far away, but, uh, yeah, so I've been experimenting with that. Um, it's pretty fun just to like throw a smoke grenade into a small room and (laughs) completely disorient everyone because I don't think they're expecting it, honestly, because so few people use those grenades. What are all I mean, the, the total grenade types? Because there's also gas grenades, right, as well as frags. Yeah, there's gas grenades, frag grenades, incendiary grenades. There's anti-tank grenades, which is a special category. It doesn't actually go in your grenade slot. Um, yeah, the incendiary grenades are pretty irritating because they, you know, they deny a, a pretty decently sized area where you're going to catch on fire if you run through it. Um, so they're very useful. Like I get why people use them. Like I get why people would want to use that and see like the damage go tick, tick, tick on their screen versus like I made a big plume of smoke that I guess, you know, maybe helped me in some way. You know, it's not, there's no numerical like, uh, um, reward for using smoke well, but I don't know. I had some great times capturing points and, uh, you know, just shielding us with smoke cover. Battlefield one is fun. It's also really frustrating and you can go through entire like 30 minute matches that are just completely boring and, and suck. Uh, and then you can have like a great one. So I don't know. I've had mixed results over the weekend playing it a lot. Well, I saw, I saw some people talking about how the newest mode, the front line mode, right. Can, can sometimes last thir- like three hours for a single match. Yeah, or even even longer. Apparently, I pl- I've played that a bit. Uh, that one's funny. That that is not intentional. Um, I think there is supposed to be a time limit, and they're going to bring that back. <laughs> but the way it works right now is that um, you have two teams capturing like a line of points sequentially, and if one team gets all the way across the map and captures the last point, they then have a limited amount of time to capture like two radio towers, uh, and if they don't do it. And it resets. You go back, and yeah, because of I, I actually don't know if why. I, mean, I guess it was a bug. Maybe um, there's no time limit on the whole thing. So if someone doesn't win, you just keep playing forever, theoretically. <laughs> but uh, it's funny that sounds you know, event- so painful to me, and yet some of my fondest shooter memories are of playing Halo 1 on PC on massive custom maps where servers would just host a capture the flag game that people would be constantly entering and exiting, you know, join in progress for just hours. And of course, capture the flag was just running 24 seven on this server, but even a single game could sometimes last four or five hours because you had touch return as like the default back then. So you could get a flag, spend 30 minutes like battling your way back across the map, sneaking, getting all the way to your base. And then there's some clueless dude on the other team who's just like been camping in your base, spawn killing people for for <laughs> kicks and like sees you running up with the flag and just like gets a grenade on you and shoots you in the head once and then touches the flag and returns it. And it's like, all right, well, there goes an hour of work. I guess this match is going to go on for another five hours. I fucking loved that shit. Yeah, stuff can be super fun. I I did play some front lines. I didn't have any that went like an hour or even two, you know, two hours, three hours, like other people have reported. But um, it is fun to have to like get close to winning and then somehow we screw it up and it goes back. Uh, But most of the matches I played were pretty decisive. I, I was trying specifically to get into one of those like endless matches so I could write about that. But uh, yeah, it, uh, it didn't happen, but I'm with you that those like weird, extremely long matches. I mean, I guess it's sort of like accidental planet side when that happens in another game. Sorry. There was just yeah. like a weird looking bug on my arm. Okay. Oh, nice. Um, <laughs> I, I want to read about like Tyler Wilde's 17 day war where you just leave your PC <laughs> running battlefront and you're, you, you just sleep and then you come back and the same match is still going and you play it for 10 hours and then sleep again. And it's still it's just there. You keep like war, always frontline journals. Yeah. Like as if you were like in the trenches day seven, like, my dog no longer recognizes me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where she is, actually. Hopefully she... Oh, there she is. Uh, just staring at people outside. So, yeah, just a ton of Battlefield for me. But I want to play 
uh, Mr. Shifty, which is kind of Hotline Miami-ish. Uh, it looks kind of cool. And Tom, what's that game with the hook? That Flint man, hook. I was, yeah, I want to play Flint Hook. That looks cool too. Yeah, I've been some playing a little bit of Flint Hook uh, for uh, like in the last couple weeks. And... Tom, what's that game with the Flint Hook in it? Oh, oh, it, <laughs> yeah. I think it's Flint Hook. Um, yeah, that <laughs> okay, game is cool. that game is really really fun. It's a very very cool roguelike. Give us the breakdown of it as as a roguelike because it has some degree of progression that you get to retain, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, it does. It's it's the type of game where it's like when you're in the middle of a a map, it's a roguelike. But then, kind of outside of that, there's a bit more structure. There's there's more to choose from. Um, so it's not like Rogue Legacy where you're just well, it is like Rogue Legacy in that you you're going through these randomized areas. But it's not like Rogue Legacy in that you just like throw yourself at the same dungeon over and over and it's over It's not again. about grinding yeah. some meta experience accrual. Yeah, there, that's an aspect of it, but it's like, yeah. So real real quickly, uh, Diego just subscribed for two months. Lemonade just subscribed for him, so subscribed. My Beards, who we don't care about because it's James, subscribed, but who cares about him? Boo. Uh, F- Fly J Dix 11 subscribed. Thank you very much, guys, everyone. Uh, that being said, Roguelike, or uh, Flint Hook, excuse me. So the way Flint Hook, the interesting thing about Flint Hook is that you take these upgrades into into battle and you can get more upgrade slots. Um, and it is kind of like, th- think like Castlevania, Metroidvania style where you're like going from room to room, right? Like it's these set rooms and you go through a door that is like a mini transition and then you're in the next room and like each room is an encounter um, and those rooms are randomized, and the order of that stuff is randomized. But the, the thing I like is, at the beginning, you say, okay, I'm going after this bounty. So there's this special pirate who I want to capture, um, and you click their choice, and it's like, to find this pirate, you're going to need to complete... Basically, th- there's like a canonical explanation for this, but it's like, you're going to need to go through three other ships to get to them. Um, and so you are presented with an option of three ships that like kind of tell you like okay this room is going to have be a li- this ship's going to be a little harder and have this sort of treasure in it this ship's going to be a little easier it's going to have this sort of encounters in it and you get to choose one and then you go into it you complete it and then you get another choice of three random ships for the next encounter so you get a little bit of control over what the randomization is going to be like and then it saves in between those encounters. So you're working towards this goal of finding this pirate, which is inevitably a boss fight. Um, And you're like very clearly like, okay, I'm going after this guy, I have to do three ships, and then once I do the three ships, I'll fight the boss, and if I can complete him there, I win. But if you die at any point in any of those three things, you have to restart from the beginning. So Hmm. what it ends up being, and, and that might not have been the clearest description, but what it ends up being is like, these more bite-sized roguelike segments that are tied together with kind of more linear progression. That's interesting. Um, yeah, and I actually, I really, really like it because it, it is more compelling to me to play than something like, you know, even something like Enter the Gungeon where it doesn't feel like you're just kind of throwing yourself at the same task slowly getting better and better. Like, you you feel that progression and you kind of feel like you are just playing these little bite-sized randomized campaigns. Um, and they're really hard. Like you can't, like at least I couldn't, and I don't think many people could just like run through to the first boss and like get them right away. Like it is, it is tricky and you do have to upgrade You're going to die. Yeah. You're going to die as roguelikes do. Um, so yeah. Flint Hook is a, is a, a good one to look out for. I think it just came out today actually. That, that sounds right. Yeah. Live on steam. Hey, Oh, um, yeah, so you should check that one out, Tyler, if you if you are interested yeah. in it. What else did I did I take your net your now playing segment by by suggesting that? Did you have something else? No, yeah, I I don't know. I've been playing. Uh, I actually got back into Overwatch a bit. That's m- been one of the main things I've been playing recently. Um, I, the Uprising thing made me kind of reminded me how much I l- used to love 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 that game. Um, I had a moment where I like the first time I solo queued in literally probably six months in Overwatch. I got put into a team with like, you know, the classic team. Like immediately it reminded me why I stopped playing Overwatch solo queue because it was like 
we were on defense. The payload was just around the corner from the final point. There were six minutes left on the timer, so it was like a massive amount of time. And our team was like Genji, Hanzo, Widowmaker, Diva, and then like <laughs> Junkrat. And it was like, oh, great, sure. And I went in as Mercy, and like we ended up winning. Like we ended up being able to stop that point and, and winning that match. But um, I checked the stats, and in the six minutes, the last six minutes of the game, where they had pushed all the way to the end, and we had to hold them off right before they finished it, I came in six minutes left. I had. I healed as Mercy 37% of the total damage my team took just in those six minutes before the game ended. Not bad. So, like, clearly nobody had been healing, and clearly this team was just getting rolled. Um, but I've been playing that a little more. Uh, I also, the other game I wanted to call out actually was Nier. Um, I really, really want to talk about Nier because we talked about it on the show before, but I finally got a chance to play it for myself, and oh my god. God, is that game weird and good? Like, like we were. I was listening to. I can't remember who it was. Um, it might have been James talking about. Like, I think it was James talking about. Like, what? Like, what the heck is this game? Basically, you know. Like, how do you define it? And he was like, "It's kind of an action RPG. It's kind of a bullet hell." But like, the the truth is, like, I, I didn't really understand that. And it really is like a weird twin stick shooter bullet hell action RPGs, like, it, it, it is a combination of all of those things. But the thing I didn't expect when I was hearing about it being, like, this amalgamation is that it it is very cohesive, even, even with all of those weird things, and it's hard to describe, and you use a million different genres. The actual playing of it, you, you play it and you go, oh, I, I kind of understand what this is. I just in no way can put it into words. Like, it it feels very structured, and it feels very cohesive. Um, Yoko Taro, <laughs> the, the director, doesn't quite have the, the like, auteur power of, like, a Kojima in, in sort of our broader recognition of, like, people who shape kind of games with their, with their own vision or, like, a Ken Levine or something. But if you look back at the history of his games, I think the one the one common thread is that they are all very cohesively weird uh, in, in their own ways, usually in very similar ways. Like if you look back at, at Drakengard and stuff, like they're not all necessarily good games, but they all have a very strong identity of what, what particular flavor of weird they are that kind of permeates the whole thing. I think, honestly, I think Nier is, is the game to play right now. Like I think if, if you're looking for a, big budget $60 game to spend all of your hard-earned money on. Like, I think Nier is worth playing. It's just a... I've, I haven't played something like it in a while. Um, full disclosure, the controls I thought were just garbage at first. And, like, I was... With a tr- controller? Or yeah, with a controller. And I was like, I just don't understand what I'm supposed to be doing right now. And then slowly I kind of figured it out. And now that I'm about, like, an hour and a half in, so I haven't played, like, too much because um, I just got it yesterday. Like, I... I'm figuring it out more, but it's the only... We were talking about this earlier, actually. It's the only game that I've played with a controller where I've actually had, like... Like, normally I have, like, my thumbs on the buttons, right, and then, like, one finger on this on the triggers. This is the only game I've played where I've had to have the thumb on the button, the pointer finger on the bumper, and the middle finger on the trigger. Like, my hand is, like, a claw on the controller just because you need to be pressing all of these buttons at the same time. Hmm. It's... It's it's the first game I've ever played with a controller where I've like I've understood why people might like those paddles on the back of controllers, like why you would actually need that. Maybe you should try it with mouse and keyboard. I, I tried and I, I cried a little bit and then I went <laughs> back to a controller. I did I did okay um, with a mouse and keyboard. The like the bullet heli stuff is tough because it when you like circle your mouse to do not the well like when you do the twin stick portions. Yeah. It doesn't it just registers like 30 degree increments of like aiming the gun. So your mouse is just kind of jittering. Uh, so like, it's like, it's like uh, adapting the anal- like to an analog stick style movement or something. Yeah. It's that part isn't good, but I found the like uh, regular, like 3d combat to be fine with a mouse. Granted, I didn't do very well. So maybe <laughs> I just thought it worked. Okay. It's and a I tricky was game. like, it's hard. like I'm Getting successfully bad at this. 
Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I've never been like great at this uh, style of action games, but I love playing them. Like I love it when I accidentally do something cool, but it's 90% of the time accidental, but that's okay. N- Nier is awesome. I really want to play it more. And I just haven't been like excited. I don't know. I just haven't felt in the mood to like jump into a, another big RPG after all the mass effect I ended up playing. Mm, that's but I will. I haven't I haven't dove into a big RPG in a while, so this is refreshing to me. Well, I have, which is the this is the rare uh, chance for me to talk about something on now playing that's not like my two month long Total War Warhammer campaign, <laughs> uh, which I finally finished. Hey man, um, I was into hearing about that. So last week, the the past week, so last week we did Japanese PC Gaming Week on the site, ran a bunch of features and stuff, and one of the games that I wanted to cover more but didn't have time or opportunity to. Uh, is this RPG series called The Legend of Heroes Trails in the Sky, which I think we brought up last week because I was complaining about the name. Uh, yeah. Tra- <laughs> Trails in the Sky, cool name. The Legend of Heroes, mm, not so cool. Uh, very generic. Um, but it has been around for like 25 years or something as a, as a loosely connected series. Anyway, uh, I started playing this game last week because uh, I just wanted to know what, is the fuss about it? Why is it considered so good? It's a 2004 PC RPG from Japan, which you know, is kind of a rarity in and of itself. There are not many PC RPGs out of Japan. Uh, and I've played like hmm, about 10 hours of it or so. Uh, and I still don't get why it's so beloved by its core group of fans, because it seems fine, but pretty generic. And is it just because there wasn't a lot on PC to play, so it just filled a, a gap? I don't think so. Um, I, it, you know, people talk about it as being one of these like super epic, one hundred hour, really deep, you know, involved story games, and so maybe that's part of why I haven't gotten to the good part yet because it absolutely has one of those slow burn RPG intros where thankfully it lets you play the game pretty quickly. It's not like super tutorially, but the first like five hours of the game is prologue and it's prologue just like kind of introducing you to these characters and like it's instead of doing the thing where it's like, oh, you're the young hero from the village, fast forward two hours later and you're like already on a quest to save the world. (laughs) Like I think it's going to get there eventually, but instead of like two hours propelling you into this crazy global story it's going to take like 30 hours to propel you these rpgs are like pink floyd songs you know (laughs) it's like 25 minutes before the drums kick in exactly i'm still waiting for the drums that's like one of the best (laughs) analogies i've heard in my entire life i've gotten like a couple like quiet guitar wails in the background where you're like, oh, <laughs> something might be happening. Yeah. There, oh, the sound that, of that, a that was cool. on a pier for a little bit and then... So you say that, but like one of the things that was most notable about Near to me was how it just goes. Like it just, that game just starts. Yeah, I, they, those I are not how, typical games, yeah. the Near games. They, they explain the entire story in like one like two minute scene yeah. with like a, a video presentation and people watching it and it's like here's everything that led up to this okay and fight I robots like, really? go 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 yeah. <laughs> did i did i talk on the show about the the opening to the original the first near which was a console exclusive i've told james about this before but i don't know if i've talked about it on the show um so in the the first near uh when you put the disc in your console or i guess I guess you could probably download it on the Xbox 360 or whatever. When you put the disc in, you boot up the game before you get the title sequence and maybe even before any of the, like, the logos for, you know, physics or whatever load up. Uh, You just have a black screen and then a voice, uh, a woman's voice just shouting, Vice, you dumbass. And that's, (laughs) that's the introduction to the game is a line from, like, 20 hours in of this one character yelling at this other character. You have no context for it whatsoever, but it's a really, really well-delivered line, and it's just so f- unexpected that you're just like, what? I mean, what the? You, in near, you kill hundreds of robots, right? You, you 
it doesn't even teach you about healing. Like, you have to figure out how to heal because it's hard. You literally can't save for the first hour of the game intro. You will have a 20-minute boss fight where you're fighting a gigantic mech with saw arms that fights missile, shoots missiles at you. Finally, like, your friend dies. You kill this giant robot by, like, ripping its own arm off and beating it to death with its own saw arm. And then you, like have to f destroy other robots by, like, committing suicide, basically. And then the game has you adjust your screen brightness. Like, that happens yeah. after all of those robot <laughs> fights. Then the game is it's like, great. you probably want to make sure the image on the left is just barely visible. And you're like, what's going on right now? Like, I just killed, like, 300 robots. So that that is a degree of, like, complete meta awareness and mastery of, like, the form yeah. of the video game. And Trails in the Sky is, like, the exact opposite of that. It is, like, extremely conventional uh, style of telling a story, um, types of characters, world setting. And I, I have been enjoying it in that way. You kind of passively enjoy JRPGs if you are into them. Uh, and I've played enough that, like, it's kind of just comforting. And, like, there's some fun character banter here and there. And, like, the world is kind of cool but there's nothing in it that stands out so far, and I'm hoping to get to that point mm. because there's probably nothing in this game as interesting as, like, the first five minutes of Nier. Yeah. That's, well, that's, that's a shame, but... I think Tyler wanted, was going to say something else about Nier, and I, I cut no. him off. No. No, it's, no, no. It's well, cool. Well, I just... Yeah, the, the meta narrative is great. Like, that scene Tom was talking about when you adjust the screen brightness... It basically takes you through your menu, um, which is the game's menu, but the game's menu doubles as your, you know, basically your character's configuration. And like I, I probably mentioned it already, but I still love that you can sell off parts of your UI, like your yeah. HP bar. It's, it's, yeah, I don't know. That that's like, I guess on the surface, it's just sort of like, well, that's a clever gimmick, but. The whole game centers around this, um, you know, this idea. So it's not just a joke thrown in. Like apparently, you can sell your brain and accidentally die. It, it really doesn't <laughs> care. And, and 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 this isn't a game with any kind of auto saving or quick saving. You have to go to like the whole the whole narrative involves you like saving your consciousness basically, and that's how you reload it if you die. And it is completely unforgiving about that fact of its fiction. It's like, if you didn't save your consciousness, you're screwed. And if you do a bunch of stuff and you don't save, it's gone. Um, so, so it makes no like quality of life adjustments that would um, conflict with its uh, meta narrative, which I think is 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 pretty bold. That's such a a really cool, daring uh, like comparison to say Bioshock, where. Bioshock is like, oh, yeah, we came up with an in-fiction reason for why you can respawn yeah. and, like, have easy audio saving. We put, you're a clone, you come out of this chamber, it's all cool or whatever. But <laughs> yeah. but it's like, that's like 10 seconds of explanation to just justify, like, we made the game easy to continue progress at any point. Yeah, whereas this is, we came up with um, an in-game explanation for why you're allowed to save at all. <laughs> like, yeah. If I had my way, you wouldn't get to save, period. But we did find a way to work it into the fiction. <laughs> <laughs> Count yourself lucky. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's, yeah, I think it's cool. And it, there is a stark difference between the direction of uh, games from, like, big Western developers, definitely, which have been trending more towards, like, autosave at every checkpoint. Except sometimes Mass Effect Andromeda, for whatever reason, which just frustratingly is like, sorry, I saved 15 minutes ago. You need to drive your stupid nomad across the desert again to get back to that fight. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> so if anyone in the chat has played Trails in the Sky, uh, with, don't spoil me, because if you spoil me on a 100-hour game, I'm going to be real pissed. But like, tell me, <laughs> tell me if you have played it, um, what you think about it, and also like at what point does it start getting air quotes good uh, so that I know, <laughs> you know, have I already hit the point where you were super into this game and it's just not doing much for me or is it just a really slow burn and I'm still, uh, you know, a ways away from it? I'm in chapter two uh, 
and I am in like r- the town of the city of Rouen. That's where I am right now. So just traveling around doing JRPG stuff. <laughs> Apollo Dingo in the chat also mentions uh, Nier's multiple endings, which I haven't gotten to any ending, but I did hear that there's uh, uh, quite a few ways to play it and replay it. Yeah, and he's actually clarifying that it's it's basically one ending with a lot of different things that can happen or a lot of different changes that can happen depending on your your uh, your choices. Like there's an option in the other section of the options menu that's like just like an auto self-destruct option for your robot or for for you and uh you can choose whether you want to turn the auto self-destruct on or off and i'm there seems to be no indication that has any effect on gameplay but maybe that'll have an effect on gameplay later like hmm. it's weird little things like that that are that are cool i do want to call out uh turdog just to resubscribe for four or for nine months and dodo uk for six so thank you very much guys uh, a lot of new and resubscribing people today so we appreciate that um, but let's move on to latest news so I can actually talk about Nier more. Ha ha ha. Um, so Nier announced, I just want to bring this up really fast because it's amazing. Nier announced that it's getting a Coliseum style DLC. Uh, n- nobody's sure when exactly. Um, oh, that's Kane's outfit from the first game. Oh, I did. You mean the lingerie? Yeah. Because this game is like shameless in that regard. But, yeah, that's from the that's from the first game. That's what one of the characters wears. So it's coming out on May second in Japan. Um, but the the weird, interesting thing about this DLC uh, is that the CEO of Square Enix is like a playable fight in it. Like you can actually fight the president and CEO of Square Enix as like like he shoots heads of himself at you. Uh, there's some gameplay in, in in Japanese here that's just kind of kind of something else that you can actually like I it's such a weird choice for them to make that you can just fight a dude in a suit in this DLC. But. I love that he's floating just completely motionless. Yeah. Oh, it's so great. Um, I, I I love that this game simultaneously cares so much about canon that it's like got save points and self-destruct buttons in the menu sequence and then it's just like you know what we're gonna let you fight the ceo of square and i think you also fight the ceo of of something else is it platinum maybe yeah it's i think it's platinum um yeah there there he is so it's man what a weird weird thing that is it's pretty amazing uh so we can we can not spend too much time on that i just thought it was so strange and cool uh, all right, a n- couple other things that happened this week. Uh, in, in a similar action RPG vein, uh, did you guys see the trailer for Bandai Namco's new thing, which I believe they're calling Code Vein? That sounds correct, yeah. Yeah, it's like we're not entirely sure what it's going to be yet. They were teasing it uh, with something called, with like a tagline, Prepare to Dine, and now it's got the name Code Vein, and it's a vampire action RPG. So, yeah, the thing is, it's vampires drinking drinking blood is the... Hence, James hence is the extremely vein. mad. <laughs> Why is James mad? Well, the prepare to die, and obviously recalls prepare to die. So, you know, the the when it was teased, people were like, oh, is this like a, a you know, Souls-ish game, a Bloodborne thing? And James was... Uh, uh, Gonna be, he said he was going to be very mad if it wasn't, and it doesn't look like it is. But it's still an action RPG, right? I think I think expecting it to be Dark Souls was would, was foolish. <laughs> uh, I think James knew that it wasn't going to be, but was mad that they used that they the, used uh, the period. Yeah, that they used the tagline without teasing a uh, something Soulsy. It's kind of a groany brand synergy thing, but. I don't know. I'm I'm curious <laughs> what the game will be like. It's the developed by the team, or maybe it's not the same team, but the same um, development studio that does the God Eater games, which I don't yeah. really know much about, but I think are supposed to be like are supposed to be decent. Um, I I can't remember if God Eater is the series that's similar to Monster Hunter. I might be confusing that with um with another one. There are a few kind of Monster Hunter esque games out there. Um, but yeah, God Eater is supposed to be pretty good. So this will be an interesting, an interesting thing. 
Yeah, there's what God Eater Rage Burst Two is the one that I'm showing now. That's on Steam. Uh, James was in the chat, just just getting mad about them using that tagline. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what it is. All right, let's keep moving on this news. Look at those trend. anime characters. So boring. That's totally James's style. <laughs> James, Wes, you James, love anime so characters. I do, but those are so generic. They're so generic. <laughs> well, we'll we'll have to see. Um, I agree, though. Little that was disappoint. that was God Eater. That wasn't. Yeah, that was that was. They haven't shown actual the, gameplay. The vampire design, at least in the um, that teaser trailer, looks pretty cool. The Code Vein. I mean, it's just two D art, so who knows how that will be reflected in the game? But yeah, looks cool. So the next quick piece of news I wanted to touch on was Genji coming to Heroes of the Storm. Uh, not Overwatch news, so everyone showed up. Uh, but they're also adding Hanamura in uh, as a level. Uh, and the thing I wanted to, to pose to you guys uh, as a question, because I know neither of you really play Heroes of the Storm. Nope. And I'm waiting till that 2.0 update, which is coming next week, to, to kind of get back into it. Um, I mean, they clearly are relying on here on Overwatch, right? Like to to drum up support for this game. We talked about it at, two, at the two point when when they announced two point oh, and at that point, I hadn't actually, I, I had knew Genji was coming, but I couldn't say yet. Um, but they've added, they're adding a loot box system, they're adding Genji, they're adding an Overwatch map. Like here's the storm is, is pulling from. Overwatch as much as they possibly can, it seems, and as quick as they possibly can without overwhelming the game, uh, as le- at least is the vibe I'm getting. Like, even this map is like a payload map on a MOBA. Is that Tracer is already in the game? Yeah, Tracer, Zarya, and... Oh, my goodness. Uh, I can't remember... What, oh, Lucio. Thank you, Anthony, behind the, me. Uh, or behind the camera. So yeah, Tracer, behind you. Behind me, Tracer, Tracer, Zarya, <laughs> and Lucio are already in the game. Genji's coming. I don't know when specifically. Um, yeah, so there. I mean, I think some exciting stuff is happening with Heroes, but it's just so hard to to hold interest while this is all coming so slowly. I guess. I'm just not into MOBAs too much, but I mean, I think your analysis is correct. Yeah, I mean, Overwatch is their most popular thing right now, um, so. Yeah, make make this the Overwatch for people who don't want to play a shooter, um, and that seems like a reasonable strategy. You know, bringing elements like the meta elements of Overwatch into it, like the loot crates, um, is obvious because that's worked. Um, I don't know how well that's worked for them, but I assume they're not short on cash. Uh, they're doing okay. Yeah. I so think- that also means they have time to support this and try to build this up. I think it's cool that they they haven't just gone like, well, I guess we'll, you know, make the team smaller and not do a whole lot of updates. They they seem to be working really hard to make Heroes of the Storm more popular. I, I can't say I know how popular it is, but obviously it's not like anywhere near a, a Dota or League competitor, or else I probably would have heard that. <laughs> well, that's what I was gonna say actually was. I mean, it's clearly not Dota or League in terms of esports. Like they're they're pushing the tournament scene, but the tournament scene is just not as vibrant for this game. It just flat out isn't. Um, the HGC, this this weekly thing or weekly or monthly, one of the two, this regular series that they do uh, for Heroes, you know, it just does not get the viewership that these other games do. That's that's just flat out true. It's not, you know, a, an opinion uh, a, or like a comment on the quality. Um, it's just the facts. But seeing how much they are putting into Heroes still and how much they're updating it makes me wonder whether or not, like, I'm just misunderstanding or underestimating how popular this game is. Like, maybe Heroes has this massive following that we kind of just don't know is there and kind of don't think is there. But it, it raises the question of are they servicing an audience that's there or are they trying to pull in an audience that isn't? by adding Overwatch stuff, and, and I genuinely don't know the answer to the, that question. They're probably still making money on it um, it's, it, as a free-to-play game. they I wouldn't be surprised if, they're, if it's profitable for them. Um, but I think one of the obvious reasons for them to include Overwatch characters is Overwatch has, what, 25 characters now? 26? Um, something like that. And they... 
every person who plays Overwatch likes a character in Overwatch or likes a lot of characters in Overwatch because you play as those characters. Those characters are the totality of the game. There are plenty of Blizzard fans, millions of people who have played some Warcraft or some Starcraft or some Diablo who maybe don't give a shit about any character in those games or couldn't name more than two or three characters because they cared about you know, the strategy gameplay in StarCraft, or they cared about grinding for loot in Diablo. And so when Diablo is in the game, they may be like, oh, yeah, it's Diablo. He was the bad guy. Like, cool. But they don't yeah. have this, like, deep affinity for characters necessarily that anyone who plays Overwatch is going to have for at least, like, a dozen Overwatch characters or something like that. So that's, it makes it a really easy pull. That's pretty... I think that's definitely accurate because, like, I was a huge Diablo 2 character, and I... I, like, I know you can get into the lore of those games, but I didn't. And I put in hundreds of hours into Diablo 2, and I couldn't give a shit, you know, except for, like, the stuff that became memes and jokes, like, obviously, I, I know about. But I couldn't recite the plot of Diablo 2 to you um, because I was just, like, playing with friends for hundreds of hours and ignoring all that. Yeah, I, I loved but, Warcraft 2 as a, as a kid and as a teenager. And at, when I was a kid, I loved reading the manual and, like, getting all the character lore and background. I thought that stuff was great. But the lasting memories from the game are playing it as an RTS, not much of the character stuff. And there are some yeah. people, of course, who, like, know all the WoW lore and they're su- they were super pumped to see, you know, Warcraft characters and Heroes of the Storm. But I think there are just as many people who don't care about that aspect of it. So Overwatch is just like immediately you're going to be, oh, Genji, oh, cool, Genji's my main character. Like, I want to check that out. So it's an easy win. Well, since you guys clearly, as you said, don't care about MOBAs as much, let's go on to the other last piece of news. And this is the piece of news I really wanted to to spend more time on, so I'm glad we kind of sped through the other ones, uh, which is a little bit more Blizzard news. StarCraft 1 and StarCraft Brood War are now entirely free. And that's not, like, free to play. Like, that is... They're not half free. They're not half free. They're not two-thirds three. They're not freemium. You can go to StarCraft's website right now and just download the game. Entirety of StarCraft 1, entirety of Brood War expansion, campaign, multiplayer, all of that jazz is in there. Um, And what's more, they've added, like, spectator mode, and they've added, I believe, replays or something like that. Like, they're starting to bring some of the tech from StarCraft II into that in terms of observation stuff. Um, But, yeah, it's, like, that's really cool. Like, you can, this wasn't something that was unexpected. People knew it was coming, but I don't think, uh, I personally, at least, didn't expect it so soon. Yeah, so when they announced the HD remaster for StarCraft about a month ago, they said they would make the original free, um, but without a timeline on when that was going to happen. And the remaster is still coming in the summer, and the way it works, and I've, we've said this on the show before, but just to refresh the way it works is if you would like, you can spend uh, some amount of money. I don't think they've announced how much yet. I don't think so. Um, but some amount of money to upgrade your base version to the... HD remaster, which doesn't have any, as far as I can tell, doesn't have any new assets. It's just like high resolution assets. It has widescreen support. It has 4K well, when you say resolution. not any new, I mean, I mean, most likely they didn't. They didn't make it look like StarCraft Two. You know, it is. It is. It keeps the look of the original just in significantly higher resolution in all, essentially yeah. all areas. It's probably all it, new textures, but yeah. Yeah. Well, Do we know if they're like compatible multiplayer wise? Like if I have yeah, the original they're free version, completely cross compatible. They will be. Yeah. So um, it's basically that's, that's pretty sweet. It's basically the same game. Um, yes. But with the the visual side just completely enhanced. And I was a uh, a Command and Conquer boy, so I never really played the. <laughs> I never played StarCraft One. Me too. Hardly at all. I think so. I think I'll I think I'll play it because yeah, I was I was like this is sci fi this. Well, I guess Command & Conquer gets sort of sci-fi, but um, I was like, you know, I like little army dudes and tanks. What are these? What are these, like, aliens and things? This is stupid. I don't know why I bounced off it like that <clears throat> as a kid who loved Star Trek, but I did. I was so uh, turned off by the 
the unit um, highlighting restrictions and like the restrictions on one, the restrictions on how many units you could build, like the population limits, and then also that you could only have like twelve units like selected at a time mm-hmm. or whatever. At, at as someone who like first played Command and Conquer, I was like, I want to have like fifty tanks and you know all these grenadiers and like these yeah, just yeah, yeah. massive armies that I just like you know, click, drag, select 120 dudes and just, like, throw them at something, uh, which it, once you understand the way people play StarCraft and can, like, micromanage the, the hell out of it, it's like, oh, okay, they can actually do these things. You just, you know, you have to be really good at it. But when you're t- 13 or whatever and you're like, I'm going to play StarCraft, and then you're like, I can only select 12 units at a time or 10 units. I don't even remember what it is. In, no, it was, totally. It was eight in Warcraft 2. You're like, this is bullshit. Playing Red Alert over LAN, um, I'd have like, there were like two computers that we had in two different rooms and just like hearing someone from the other room shout as your like ridiculous tank rush shows up on their screen. Your 14 um, mammoth tanks. Yeah, those were some good memories. Anyway, this is about uh, StarCraft (laughs) and not (laughs) Command & Conquer. Hey, remember how good Command & Conquer was? Well, the interesting thing, there's this great video uh, by the unflappable Day9, uh, Sean Plott, who we love to death. Um... He, he released this this rant, basically, as he called it, a 12-minute video just, yeah, like, on Monday uh, about why he loves Brood War so much. And, and he's biased a bit because he's been playing Brood War. So what was the rant years. against? It was... He, I think he misused the word rant. I think he was just basically talking about how great Brood War is and why it was and and is still is. Um, and... It, I, what I thought was interesting is he specifically called out the 12 unit highlighting restriction as one of the great parts of Brood War because it was so hard and because it was so restrictive and and he kept calling it like the commander fantasy of like you have to handle your hotkeys so well and you have to handle you figure out how to, to set up minions or minions, excuse me, like all your units so well to be able to command this huge, huge army while also doing macro. Um, and I never, I hadn't really thought about how big of a difference that was from the first game to the second game uh, un- until he put it in that way. And he was telling, he was told this story and, and you really should go find the video from day nine, but he told this story about like, he would line up his zerglings in groups of 12 diagonally towards the direction that he wanted to to send them eventually because he figured out that he could highlight the farthest away group of 12, send them to a point. Then by the time they moved up to the next group, he would have highlighted that one and sent them up. And then by the time they moved up, he would have highlighted the next one and sent them up. So he had them staggered so that by the time he selected all of them and told them where to go, they were all one group of Zerglings. Um, and that that stuff is really cool to hmm. me. Like, that that's a really interesting aspect of Brood War that I hadn't really thought of. And I'm really, really interested to see kind of how the competitive scene is revitalized by that because Brood War is still m- immensely popular, probably more popular than StarCraft II in Korea. Um, but we could now, with HD textures and stuff like that and good observer modes, start seeing... Brood War make a real resurgence as an esport nowadays. I, I I hope that happens. Um, and and yeah, like like I was saying earlier, when when you're a kid, the the that seems like just a limitation of preventing you from doing cool things like having a giant army. But I think obviously the past what night when did it come out ninety eight ninety nine it was ninety nine I think the past you know eighteen years of High level StarCraft have obviously proven that's not really a limitation. Uh, yeah. It is it is a strength of that game. It just requires a certain level of skill to to extract that from it. So I appreciate that Day Nine made a positive rant about something instead of the the typical. I think the internet has just skewed my assumption that a rant is going to be you know someone with the name like angry blank gamer. Uh, talking for <laughs> thirty minutes about why something is is actually stupid. So, hey way, guys, way to go, gay nine. <laughs> I just wanted to make this video to talk about something that's been going on lately in the community, and we got to talk about this. There's like <laughs> it's like 
the beginning of like 40% of gaming YouTube videos. This is Angry Toast Gamer making a video rebuttal to <laughs> Angry Salmon Gamer about uh, <laughs> about Angry Aardvark Gamer's uh, initial unboxing of... You guys are offending our YouTube base <laughs> right now, okay? And I don't appreciate it. I'm making a reaction video in real time, Tom. Lay off. <laughs> Well, then I'm going to react to your reaction right now. <laughs> uh, tell you to stop. We should move on. No, yeah. Uh, it's it's interesting. I The last thing I wanted to say uh, about Brood War is if you have not played the campaign of StarCraft 1, go download this game and play the campaign of StarCraft 1. Because the StarCraft 1 and Brood War campaigns are really good. And I think, like, I never, never, never played StarCraft multiplayer. I watched a lot of StarCraft multiplayer, but I never played it myself. I am extremely excited to go back and replay the campaign single player because even even without the HD remaster because I think it'll probably hold up pretty dang well today. I remember them being pretty fun. Uh, I really liked the Protoss one from what I remember. I can't remember if I finished any of the campaigns, but I know I played a good bit of all three of them. It's just been a really long time. Um, but yeah, they, they were cool. I mean, they're, they're absolutely Blizzard's like kind of schlocky, you know, space fantasy stuff um they're not like deep storytelling but they're fun characters and like each race is just such a cool just entity and by its own right it's like all right our all our space marines are like southern they're like texan miners you know and and all the protoss are these like noble kind of alien samurai dudes and the zerg are just gross uh those those are fun <laughs> fun stories the gross faction great <laughs> great story there yeah the, that's one of the um like in in mmos you have like you have tanks and you have uh dps and then you have gross and then you have <laughs> healers and that's the four that's the the four different things i think you forgot heart isn't that <laughs> wind fire anyway, anyway we can move on uh let's talk about star wars guys because i want to talk about talk about star wars uh battlefront 2 as we said got announced there is a fancy trailer for it finally we got a what like a 30 second teaser that leaked before but now there's an actual trailer so i kind of forgot to watch this actual trailer wow, i saw man. the teaser but i'm a bad star wars fan last week I, we oh, go ahead tyler i watched it one minute before we started <laughs> uh, this live stream so right off the bat with this trailer in engine footage yeah, which dice. Is, that's dice. Typical for dice. Yeah. I know. It's just my least favorite thing on any trailer ever because they Sh used. Should to we say, talk about what game engine footage is? <laughs> well, that's the thing. Is they used to all say in-game footage, and then everyone got mad at them when it was fake, and now they say in-engine footage, and it's like, it just means it's rendered with the game engine. It doesn't mean it's rendered in real time with the game engine, or not without post effects and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, it may be in real time, but when they do in-engine trailers, they control so much more um, than when you're in a game, you know, because they're controlling the camera angle and exactly how many particles are on screen, and they can put special effects in. You know, when they build the cutscenes, they don't play the game and make the cinema, you know. They they, they work it all out so that the engine uh, on on a powerful computer can, can render some very nice-looking stuff. Um, so yeah, in-engine footage should be taken uh, should not be taken as face value as gameplay footage ever. I don't believe you. It's gonna look exactly like this <laughs> when I'm controlling it. To be fair, Although, when, dice games always look pretty darn good, though. Yeah, they do. I was gonna they say do. when when Battlefront One came out, I remember there are, there are se like segments of Battlefront One that look like to me photorealistic. So. So, it is a pretty. It's going to be a pretty looking game, regardless. We're ignoring the the trailer specifically for a second, but I want to bring up this quote that I read. I think it was through a tweet, and I can't remember what it linked to, but it was from. Uh, it was a story about like a member of Dice, and maybe a, a member of. Um, it might have been like the team that worked on uh, Horizon Zero Dawn. I can't remember, but this it was a story about how uh, an artist recognized a rock in this game and realized that The Rock was also in their game. And they had both gone to like Iceland or Ireland, I can't remember, 
and to do like the photogrammetry stuff where they scan an environment to then render yeah. it in 3D. And they had both like teams had found this really nice rock and scanned it and put it in their That's game. Amazing. That's amazing. And so incredible. there's like two different models of the same real rock in these two like ridiculously beautiful high definition video games, uh, which is just what AAA production is going to be for the next <laughs> for the for the rest of time is just like oh I, that that like that outcropping looks really weird. Is that just like down the street from my house? Somebody saw that and just like brought a bunch of camera gear and just scanned that. That weird yeah. archway. Okay. I mean, that stuff happens in movies all the time, right? Like, people film on the same locations every damn movie. It does happen, yeah. I saw something from one of the new, um, maybe one of the new Marvel movies was, like, at the same place as, like, a Jason Bourne movie or something that was, like, oh, this is, like, a tunnel in Berlin or something that's just, like, yeah, just everybody shoots a movie there because it's good for car chases or something like that. Pro tip, any time, almost any time a Hollywood movie tells you or is shot on like an east coast campus like harvard or whatever it's shot at ucla university of california los angeles where i went because like it it, it's covered in bricks and it looks like a east coast campus and they just like they literally just put post effect clouds in the sky so it's not sunny all the time and suddenly you have an east coast school and i i think it'll be interesting as you said to as we we get better at mapping real environments if like they're gonna start pulling from you know is UCLA's campus going to start showing yep. up slightly altered in video games? You know, is, is a funny question. Did you know Friends was all shot in Canada? No way. All of Friends. Oh None, they didn't do that in New York one bit. It was all Canada. Uh, Iceland gets a lot of play, too, especially for, like, alien landscapes, because uh, there, there are parts of Iceland that just look incredibly unearth-like. Um, I think, uh, oh, what's a good example? Um I mean, Battlefront Alien. definitely has some stuff yeah. they did in Iceland. All right. Anyway, that, let's that anecdote went nowhere, so go, Tom. Let's stop talking <laughs> about movies. Let's let's actually talk about Battlefront. Last week, we talked a little bit about what we'd want to see. Um, I said, I hope they stay as far away from canon as they possibly could, which is, as, as you said, Wes, very optimistic. Yeah. Um, but we did learn a few things. We haven't seen gameplay footage yet. Uh, what we do know is that it's going to come out on the 17th. Is that right? I believe November 17th. Um, I just said the 17th, excuse yeah, me. November the, 17th. Not the 17th of May, yeah. which would be in November four weeks. 17th, which is, uh, you know, the about the distance I like from game announcements now, you know, is, is six-ish months around that area from an announcement. I'm I, totally I like into zero it. months. Zero right. months is sweet. Zero months is good, too, <laughs> but... I'm, I prefer six months to three years, you know? Like, I don't ever want another Division or No Man's Sky where we look at a game at three E3s in a row and then the game comes out and we're like, eh. Well, or, the, or the first Battlefront, which EA, like, five years before that game came out, was like, we got the license. Here's, like, a picture of a snow speeder that we rendered. Uh, we're going to have a game out in four years. And then... This is, this is off topic from from battlefront again <laughs> but um you know it has to do with like uh, my review planning and stuff siberia 3 is almost out um and that game was announced in 2009 uh, and was supposed to come <laughs> out in like uh 2010 i think so um that's that's the most like duke nukem foreverish scenario that's like still going on is about but finally about to come out. What did your review calendar look like in 2009, Tyler? <laughs> <laughs> I probably had Siberia 3 on it, but um, God, I've been doing this for too long. That's interesting to hear because Siberia 2 came out in 2004. So they announced the game five years after the original, or after the, the first, the sequel. Um, and, and they were, you know, five years after the sequel, it was like, whoa, that's a bit of a time. And then it took them another eight years to get it out. There were some development problems along the way. I think there were some funding problems, but hey, it's coming out for real this time. Anyway, yeah. back to Battlefront, yeah. Star Wars. Well, I, I, I'm interested Jedi in Siberia 3. I think that game is hopefully going to be good. <laughs> but yeah, so a couple of things that we have learned hard details. Uh, the campaign is going to be like a unique story where you follow an Imperial squadron, right? Like, Correct, yeah. You, you, or like some elite 
Imperial yeah, yeah. forces. You're the bad guys. And the, the interesting thing that we found out about it is actually that it's being written by uh, this the lead writer from Spec Ops The Line, which is a game I still haven't played, but I constantly hear referred back to as just like a fantastic shooter campaign. Yeah, it's good. It's real good. So that's, I mean, does that get you guys hot and heavy to hear that it's, that it's the same writers or... So d- disclosure, I am friends with the with Walt Williams. Like I know him uh, ah. decently decently well. He he used to live in San Francisco, um, but doesn't anymore. Um, but he and a former editor at IGN are like the the head writers on um, on this game. But yeah, so Walt, uh, who wrote Spec Ops, if you've played Spec Ops, you know it's like a very dark, cynical, weird game, uh, which fits his persona very well. Um, but I wouldn't expect that to come through so much in Star Wars. Um, but then the maybe the foil for him is is Mitch Dyer, who used to write for IGN, who is like the biggest Star Wars f- fanboy uh, that I know. And so the two of them probably will play off of each other very well. Where so you know here here's the writers' room. Walt's like, what if we killed everyone and the game was blackness for three hours? And Mitch is like, what if the Jedi's did cool somersaults and then like told each other that, <laughs> that uh, they loved each other? And then that's gonna that'll balance out and then it'll come out into like a good drama. That's what I'm thinking. I'd pay to I'd pay to see that conversation. <laughs> They'll meet in the middle between everyone is dead and everyone and, does cool somersaults and is happy and hugs it out. Yeah. <laughs> That's a big middle to meet in. Of course, I'm generalizing. I don't think either of them would actually uh, suggest these things for a story. But that, that gen- covers no, like that wasn't that's what's it, that's what's in the heart though for each of them. One is <laughs> one is black and one is uh, pink. I don't know what's true love. The color of true love. As Wes silently hopes, neither of them are fans of the podcast. No, I hope they're listening. They'll they should get a kick out of it. <laughs> tell uh, me, tell me if it's accurate, guys. Tell me if my <laughs> impression of your writer's room is accurate i want to know we'll be back with their comments next week (laughs) (laughs) um so that's that's an interesting side of it i am glad that they're going like wide with it rather than you know you follow luke skywalker you know or, or anything like that i'm i think the only way they could have pulled this off is if they just went with a unique story so i'm glad to see that uh it was confirmed that we are going to all three eras right mm-hmm. uh prequel original and newest is there a name for the new trilogy sequel area i guess i don't know eh. force awakens era yeah so the other thing though that's interesting the other two be- like pieces of information that came out of the weekend uh was one it probably won't have a season pass which is like a weird thing to say as news but um they they're they're looking to not have a season pass maybe they saw titanfall 2 as a success in that regard right like maybe there is there is a lesson to be learned there or maybe it's the same thing they did with titanfall 2 where they were like titanfall 1 didn't do well so we'll make this game much more appealing from a consumer standpoint well battlefront 1 sold a shitload so right but it still it wasn't like I mean, Battlefield once sold a lot, but and I didn't think it was a bad game, but I don't think anybody looks back on Battlefront. Excuse me, I meant Battlefront, not Battlefield 1. Um, Battlefront 1 was like, it was fine, but I don't think anybody looks back and, and, and talks about how incredible that game was or anything. You do, know? You want, uh, do you want a surprising statistic that this is from a new story I'm working on now that isn't up? Give me the scoop. Um, but the, yeah, the ESA just released sort of its like industry snapshot um, for for last year. Uh, and apparently Titanfall 2, according to them, you know, I don't know everything about where their data comes from, was the 16th best-selling game of 2016, which that really surprised me. Um, Battlefront was 14th. Interesting. And Battlefront came out when? Yep. Uh, when did that come out? October or November 2015? Yeah, I think so. So, like, that's pretty weird yeah it came out november 2015 so in so it was the 14th best-selling game af even after the not including its first three months 
Well, first according to the SA, month and a half. Two, yeah, yeah. Excuse me. And their sources are the NPD Group Retail Tracking Service, Digital Games Tracking Service. Those are the three things. the The number one was still Call of Duty Infinite Warfare, even though we heard about you know Call of Duty selling uh, worse than it used to. Tyler, um, the, our review didn't didn't make a difference. It didn't. <laughs> it didn't make people stop. Overwatch is up there. Minecraft is still up there. But yeah, Titanfall 2, there was kind of a narrative around it that was like, ah, it released next to Call of Duty, next to Battlefield 1. Like, what were they thinking? No one's going to play it. But apparently they did. I am really curious uh, how accurate those numbers are to digital downloads. Like you said, it had some digital element in there. But does you know are they getting all of the, the digital yeah. sale data? I don't know. Yeah, it's hard to say. Real fast, a shout-out to Buttface Jones, who resubscribed for two months in a row. Says, PSA Reflex Arena 1.1.0 released today. You can be a bunny bot. Thank you for your time. Thank you for that message. Arena shooters. Woo! Uh, so Battle for Battlefront 2 is adding classes back. Yeah, and that's like the last thing Like they used to have back in the, in the old games. Uh, so that's cool. I hope that that adds to a bit more interesting variety in the weapons. And makes them feel a bit more distinct. Um, I think that that would be a big point in its. Oops, excuse me, just smacking my mic. A uh, big point in its favor from the the last game because like I fondly remember the old Battlefront games, which were not amazing shooters by any standard. You know, they were pretty like goofy, kind of cartoony, moving games, but they were really fun. And all of the classes had pretty distinct types of weapons. You know, you'd have your, like, artillery uh, heavy weapon equivalent guy with the Star Wars version of a rocket launcher, which was a cool thing to have as just your base weapon and, you know, these heavy, heavy guns where when I played the new Battlefront, everything kind of felt the same. They would just have, like, slightly different rates of fire and some differences in damage value and distance, but, like, it didn't feel super distinct. So I'm... I'm hoping that that makes it uh, makes it feel like a much much more uh, I don't know diverse shooter than Battlefront did. Yeah, I'm I'm hoping the same because that was it did end up feeling very samey in Battlefront. Like it, it I don't know the the classes hopefully will allow you to read what your team has brought into a fight better as well if you can see how many classes are already out mm -hmm. there and kind of adjust but honestly i didn't ever think there was too much strategy involved in the middle of a firefight when you were in a big battle in battlefront anyway like it was kind of just everyone picked the loadout that they wanted and you moved on i'm interested to see how this is going to affect a lot of different things um Honestly, the main thing to me is I hope they make it less like the old Battlefronts. Like, I'm glad they have classes, but I hope they make the shooting more satisfying than the old ba Battlefronts, because I thought that they did a really good job of replicating the gunplay in the newest Battlefront, and I think that actually, like, was a, a detriment to me enjoying it, was having these kind of not-much-feedback blasters mm -hmm. was was not very satisfying, and I hope... I hope they give the guns some more weight in this game. It's a hard thing to do with lasers, right? Like it is, they, yeah. They can't just be like Star Wars is bullets now. Uh, <laughs> but they yeah, it's a hard that's a hard problem to solve. I don't quite know how you do that. Yeah, the recoil on lasers is a different sort of issue. But I mean it's all made up anyway, so just make up some yeah. some worse guns, I guess, with more recoil or something. But I, Can you I, I would love like the exact same thing as as Battlefront, uh, but it's Star Wars and everyone just has like phasers that just go, Brr, and then that's it. <laughs> like, like there's no feedback at all. Like Star Trek <laughs> TV style phasers. Yeah, 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 exactly. They eventually they had to be like, okay, but there are also rifles that like look cooler, but forget about those just like shitty little handheld things that like shoot a uh, beam of light that was always such a funny thing in the in the movie star trek so they're like all right we need like this big rifle to shoot this dis <laughs> disintegration beam but it's like dude why would you want that when you can have like a mini dustbuster yeah. thing that you just casually like 
you know, stick it in your pocket and you pull it out and you can just vaporize somebody in the yeah, push can, of a button. Like, why would you, you want this giant rifle? This makes no sense. Yeah. You can vaporize people with something like the size of an iPhone. So there's really no need <laughs> for anything else. Yeah. Anyway, that's all. Um, Star Trek is better than Star Wars. Uh, I just want to <laughs> shut, shut your throw mouth. Throw that in there. Can I mute Tyler from over here on this laptop? You, you could. Like, uh, and I mean, I'm okay. I'm not gonna stop you if you do. That's all I'll say. <laughs> uh, the I think the thing I'm most looking forward to is seeing how this story, uh, if the story feels like kind of a second coming of um, uh, oh, I'm just I just blanked on the name. The the really cool um, team squad based shooter. Oh right. Uh, from about t- eight eight years ago, ten years ago. Um, that I knew the name of and then just just popped out of my head. Um, but it was a really fun... Republic, Republic Commando. Commando, yeah. So go. Clone Wars era, which I have no love for whatsoever, but they were just like, what if you have four cool Stormtrooper dudes and it kind of is like Metroid Prime, cool, like, immersive visor thing, but you get to give them squad commands and, like, just play, like, a good grounded shooter in the Star Wars setting... And I think everybody who played that game was like, this is rad. And then they never went anywhere with that. So I hope this kind of brings back that that cool like squad squad campaign design. I think that is uh, an area rife with potential. Yeah. Uh, one of the other things we saw from the trailer that I do real quickly want to mention before we jump ahead um, is they also said they're going to have more kind of ship combat stuff. Which means I I hope it means that they fix how you get into ships. No that more was, tokens, just yeah, in the middle I of the field. I really didn't like the token thing in Battlefront, and I mean it wasn't it wasn't the worst. It just was so un like uninteresting and uninspired, and I really and I mean just flat out less cool, right? Like the the getting into a, a X wing in a hangar and flying out of the hangar and shooting someone was so much cooler than just like picking up a token and disappearing. It was a way to get around the problem of like people going to the spawn and like stealing the enemy team's ships and then just like totally owning the sky, I guess. Um, or maybe it was a way, I, I don't know if that was the reason they did it. Maybe it was, they didn't want to build all that infrastructure involved in animating characters getting in and out of the ships and all that kind of stuff into the maps. So not a problem for me. Like, I... Oh, Tyler now, But I love the old battlefields. Oh, I froze? Uh, you're good. Am, am I back? Yeah. Back, I yeah. love the old battlefields where everyone, like, spawns at your base and sprints toward the airplanes and, like, <laughs> half your team is completely useless at the start of the game because they're all hoping another plane spawns. I kind of miss that. Maybe it's just nostalgia. Uh, I guess technically the new battlefields have a better system where you have to select a vehicle from the spawn screen and you don't have, you know, 10 players standing around the airfield. But it's just something so quaint about that stupid, like, rush to get the vehicles. It's also really satisfying, especially, like, in the in Battlefield 1, to, like, jump in vehicles with people you know and like i want i want that level of you find a yeah. you find a you know a star wars jeep just sitting on the map somewhere <laughs> and like get in and yeah. then like get a buddy and you know star wars when, you just, when you just spawn in the vehicle it, it just disconnects you from the idea that this is like this is we're soldiers in this real battle and we're getting in and out of vehicles i don't know yeah. Okay, except for the flying cars on Coruscant. Actually, let's open it up to a Twitch chat Q&A. If you've got questions for us, please tag us with at PC Gamer in the Twitch chat. Ask your questions. If you're a subscriber, we'll try to get to your questions first. Thank you very much. And uh, and while, while we're waiting for questions to roll in, except for the flying cars in Coruscant, right, are there, like, are there cars in I mean, Star Wars? Are there- are there wheeled vehicles? Yeah, because there's those flying cars, and there's a lot of flying cars there. And then you've got things like tanks on the Naboo fights, and you've got the the land speeder, you know, in in Tatooine. In the, but that's kind of the closest we have to like a car. In the hangars, they have like transport vehicles, but I don't remember if they. I assume they didn't have 
wheels visible. Like I'm sure the the physical things that they used had wheels because it was the 70s. But uh, the in the fiction, they were probably supposed to be like little hover hover barges that you would ride your X wing or whatever. Yeah, this is important. This is important stuff. Actually, the community, the Overwatch community, apparently freaked out because they added a car with wheels in this latest update. Oh yeah, that was pretty funny. And apparently. Jeff Kaplan had said at one point that there was an arbitrary rule that they were following that no car was allowed to have wheels. Just Every car ruined your fly. fiction, Blizzard. Yeah. You fools. Metzen is gone and it all <laughs> falls apart. Cars get wheels. Cats and dogs living together. Pandemonium. Anyway, um, let's take some questions. Uh, annoying James Davenport is asking questions and taking questions away from viewers. But Wes, what's your favorite Dark Souls boss, he asks. Oh, my favorite Dark Souls boss. Hmm. The one that's probably the most memorable for me is Artor- Artorius of the Abyss from the DLC for the first game. I don't know if that's my favorite, but that a lot of the Dark Souls 3 bosses um, kind of take after Artorius, but he's like the first boss that you fight in Dark Souls 1 who moves like with the speed or more speed than like a human player Mm. um and he's just like jumping at you from across the room and is like it's really more of a duel which you don't didn't get too much of in the in dark souls one and you get more of in dark souls three um but it's a pretty intense fight and his design is amazing i like the tree in dark souls three where you have to hit him in the balls a bunch you do kill. A, <laughs> you do kill think, a big tree. I think Thomas from behind the camera just quietly yelled "tree balls" at us. But yes, uh, Verendil asks. Uh, I was thinking about antagonists earlier, and to this day, there's still not been one that I wanted to murder as much as uh, Irenicus from Baldur's Gate Two. I might be pronouncing that wrong. Uh, who's the best antagonist you've come across? One that has really done their job well, and you couldn't wait to beat. Um, the, the immediate thing that jumped into my head was Handsome Jack, I think, um, from Borderlands. You think or you know? I, well, I mean, I, I, <laughs> I'm stalling to give you time <laughs> to give, give a good answer, but no, Han- Handsome Jack is the one that jumped into my mind quickly because he did a really good job of like being a lovable antagonist, but also an antagonist that you like really wanted to punch in the face real bad. Um, but he also wasn't like nearly as evil or as maniacal as a lot of the other antagonists that you see in games. So I'm I'm not sure. Whoever wrote Dead Space 3 is my antagonist. <laughs> Cuz they made me hate every character in that game with a passion. <laughs> That's the best answer ever. I love Dead Space and Dead Space say... 2. Fuck Dead Space 3. <laughs> Uh, I never played two or three. I really liked one. Two is two that... is great. It manages to keep most of the horror while being a much better action yeah. game. And then three starts out okay and then just gets... It's like every cliche bad decision that characters can make to justify like arbitrary plot development is thrown at you in that game and is just... Oh, it's... You kill a moon at the end of it. That's <laughs> like a possessed thing. It just it's bad. It's bad. Man. Mine is Max Payne's inner demons. Mm. He's got a lot of them. I, I actually I couldn't really think of anything. I don't know. Mine is Chirpy from City Skylines. The little Twitter bird notification. Chirpy can go die in a fire. Uh, and there's That's a mod fair. that lets you do that, actually. Um all right, let's let's keep going though. That was a good question. Buttface Jones asks, if you're looking at a Kickstarter for a game, what are some of the core things that make you want to back it, assuming the game is one you would want to play? Uh, what are some things that make you want to stay away? So this is a really really interesting question because game Kickstarters, board game Kickstarters are still huge. Video game Kickstarters have had more trouble in like the last year or so than they used to. You used to be able to get a game on a Kickstarter that would like just make, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars like video games. And now most video games are asking for like 20 at the most. So um, it's, it's shifted a bit. 
I don't back any games on Kickstarter because, or any video games on Kickstarter anymore because I don't want to have a conflict of interest for any reason, even though that's just my own, my, my own rule, basically, with it. Um, but for, like, board games and stuff, a big thing is, like, the production quality. Like, to me, this might sound like, a, what's the word, trivial? But the production quality of the video that they produce, like, and the campaign, like, page, really actually matters to me. Because if they can't be bothered to put together, like, a, a nice-looking, well-prepared showing of their game in the Kickstarter, like, how am I going to believe that they're going to do anything else they say, basically, with, with that amount of effort? Um, so that's one of the things I look for is, like, even if the game concept itself seems a little rough, if they put a lot of thought into it that's not just, like, marketing money thought, like, I... It, it gets me more interested. Um similarly just like i think it's just got to be the like it comes down to the concept for me like i'm not going to back <laughs> to be perfectly frank i'm not going to be backing another 2d platformer like there are so many 2d platformers already out but like if a game is interesting and compelling like I'll, i will look to back it anything you guys yeah, i don't know i don't um i don't really back anything on kickstarter i think i've backed like one thing it was a piece of software before but yeah obviously you know check on who's involved with it um and i think i think tom's point about the quality of the uh of the video is a good one i would just want to make sure it's a serious project um yeah i haven't, yeah, I haven't I, backed I, anything in years either I bought a, uh, I pre-ordered a harmonica <laughs> of all things <laughs> made by, that was going to be made by a company. It got profiled in like, I don't know, a bunch of big publications as they've engineered this like amazing harmonica. And I, it was like 200 bucks or something. Shut the um, hell up. Maybe it was like a hundred. <laughs> I don't, I don't Wes, remember. Well, Wes having never none came. of your harmonica talk. You kickstarted a $200 harmonica. We've been making was, harmonicas for like 500 years. Come on. <laughs> This was before Kickstarter, and it was—I think it was a gift because I had like, expressed interest in it, and someone was like, "Oh, that I'll pre-order that." This was like years ago, before Kickstarter existed, Gee. and no package ever arrived. I looked into the company like a while later, just gone, you know. And so, like, it, even if something looks legit, it's—it's it's such a risk because, like, this company was profiled by like probably like Wall Street Journal and shit, and <laughs> it never happened. So. Jim says your movie just, hat. Like, your movie. Oh yeah, yeah. I I kickstarted a hat that says movies on it. Um, <laughs> wait. R can you pull this up really quick, Thomas? It's just a hat that says movies. That was what the Kickstarter was for. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I got the hat that says movies. That came. <laughs> You're not wearing the it. Weirdest thing in the Why world. Why aren't you wearing your movies hat? <laughs> I don't know where it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, the last thing I kickstarted backed was actually Rising Sun, which was the a board game. The game looked awesome, and I didn't want to spend like one hundred and fifty dollars or whatever it was yeah. to back it. Uh, no, it was a hundred dollars, um, and then I put a little more money in for some extras. But like, will you bring it to my house in a year and a half when it's out? Yes, I will. <laughs> um, it's yeah, it's a board game actually designed by Eric Lang, who is also the lead game designer of Duelist. I'm so predictable. Anyway. I would say uh, if you're gonna if you're looking at something to kickstart, assume that a game will cost far more than you actually think it will to make. Yeah, and then judge their the amount they're asking for on Kickstarter <laughs> accordingly. Um, add add a year onto the release date and. <laughs> <laughs> and and or, add the, and so add that in, and then look at what they're promising, and see if what they're promising seems real, like to realistically be taking that into account. If they're like, our game will be out in a year, and it's not a Kickstarter specifically to do like the last bit of you know post production yeah. on it, then be like, I don't know if these people are being realistic about what they're trying to do here. <laughs> yeah, we need five thousand dollars to make an open world MMO. <laughs> um, It'll be out next year. Yeah, that kind of stuff um, can be concerning. Yep. Yeah, I. I mean, one of the other things was I backed a I backed a card game a while back called Story Wars, uh, and they made a ton of money. They made a ton of money back in this Kickstarter, and they had promised so many things, um, and then they 
they delivered the game. The game itself was great. They delivered the expansion that they promised, which was great. Um, and they didn't ever follow through on any of the extra stuff, like the digital version or all these extra rule sets and all these other things that were stretch goals. Um, and about a year after they stopped communicating, they sent out one last Kickstarter backer email. This was years ago, right? But they sent out one last Kickstarter backer email that was just like, hey guys, so we're not just sitting on our throne of money, like not fulfilling your requests. We're bankrupt. We've been bankrupt for six months. Like everything cost more than we thought it was going to. Shipping the games cost more than we thought it was going to. Like we just ran completely out of money even after all of the extra money we got from Kickstarter and we only had enough to fulfill our backer orders and even then we lost money on the whole thing. So like Kickstarter is hard. Like it really is hard. Yeah, and don't don't assume this applies more to like card games, but don't assume that a large Kickstarter haul necessarily means they have made a ton of money because a lot of the games uh, they'll sell like a fifteen dollar tier, which gets you a copy of the game, and so maybe then a you know thousands and thousands of people buy it and they get like three million dollars on you know in Kickstarter money or something, but the vast majority of that money is just individual copies of the game people have bought and maybe it only costs like a couple bucks to produce a copy of the game a few more dollars to ship it but all of a sudden once you put fees and stuff in there they're only making a few dollars profit on you know each game they're selling and once you start throwing in you know backer rewards and stuff like that money just goes real fast all right let's take uh, another question i saw from a subscriber that was not james um, Varendil asks, <laughs> how much are you looking forward to Peter Molyneux's game on a scale of zero? Um, yeah. What, apparently, what is Peter Molyneux's game? I, nobody knows. He like, this is, this is so unfair to him because he's like someone in an interview was like, Hey, are you working on a new game? And he was like, yeah, but I don't want to talk about it. And now everyone's like, Oh, Peter Molyneux's working on a game. And it's like, he did not generate any of that hype. Like he, he is doing everything he can to not hype it and like everyone just shut up about peter molyneux's game and we'll see how it i'm is actually when it comes i'm out. hyped about it now damn it tyler no, i didn't know he was making a game i like peter molyneux you know he's made <laughs> mistakes he's over promised before but i think he's a really interesting personality and he's also uh had a hand in some really good games so that is true moving on because moving on uh, I'm hyped. I can't wait for no, Peter Molyneux. No, stop game. it. Stop it. Tom, cut his mic. Wanna, cut his away. mic. One more question uh, from subscriber Turdog asks: What racing games, arcade or sim, are you looking forward to this year? Uh, my answer is Forza Horizon Three because always Forza Horizon Three. I know it already is out, uh, but it's supposed to get another DLC at some point that they haven't announced. James and I were just talking about that yesterday. I had to test a keyboard light late last week. Um, and I tested it a little bit in Forza, and I was just like, man, I really need to stop playing this game. And then I just kept playing Forza longer. It just, it's, God, I love that game. I don't actually know any racing games coming out this year other than uh, the new Dirt. Mm. And I've never really gotten into that series. It's just like a little too simmy for me, I guess, even though it's not that much of a sim. But just never clicked with that genre, with that uh with that series. So I don't know what other racing games are even coming out. Yeah. Project Cars had, 2 got a shout out in the chat. Dirt 4 was the one that most people said though. Yeah, Project Cars 2 is like the big the big thing for like sim fans. Um Dirt Yeah. Dirt's good. Uh there's this game that I remember because I put together a bunch of games for our like what's coming in 2017 list called uh Drift Stage that looks kind of oh, cool. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like very Sega Genesis retro. Yeah, it's um, an early alpha demo. Yeah, yeah, that's a, a, it's a gorgeous game. I love the style of it. But I don't so know. I just, I linked that in the chat. It, I'm, I'm not like a huge racing fan, so anything that looks like cool or different. Whoa, I just turned that on and it was loud. Um, <laughs> I, I was always more of like a battle cars. Like I liked the Twisted Metal series, um, like Twisted Metal Black on the on the old PS2. Um, any game where cars could fight each other was good in my book. I had a game on the Genesis called Combat Cars. <laughs> it was bad, but I liked it at the time. 
Yeah, I liked the Micro Machine games way back when. There's a new Micro Machines game coming out this year. That's a thing. Oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, Davis just mentioned that in the chat. So uh, that was uh, uh, Jinx, actually. Now you can't talk to <laughs> Fabus. Is there a new Flat Out game coming this year? Fabus just said that in the chat, too. Flat Out was a game. I was way into I think it was Flat Out 2. I was super into that game for a while. That was a game where you could play darts with the person. Oh, that was flat out. Okay. By by launching them outside out the windshield of your car. Gruesome. Yeah. It was a little bit it was a little bit gory. But that's all the time we have for today. Thank you very much for your questions. Uh, the actual answer is Mario Kart 8 Deluxe for the Switch. And oh, thank you had to you sneak playing. that in there. <laughs> okay, <laughs> moving on. We will see you guys all next week, 1 p.m. Wednesdays, Pacific Time, right here at twitch.tv slash PCGamer. And thank you for listening at PCGamer.com slash podcast, where you can also leave us comments on the latest episodes. You can watch at YouTube.com slash PCGamer if you would like to watch the episodes after the fact and see our lovely faces. Uh, and, and beyond that, Drop us a line, tom at pcgamer.com is my email. You're always welcome to reach out, twitter.com slash pcgamer, basically any sort of social media thing slash pcgamer, and you'll get us. So uh, so leave us some feedback. We'd love to hear from you uh, about why Tyler is wrong about Star Trek. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, and we will see you next week. Bye. Bye.